Seven of the headlines. Welcome, welcome. If you're new to the channel, my name's Elliot and you're watching Rickety Ski Reviews. Today, we're finally talking about the Vocal Kendo 88. Now, first off, I wanna start out by saying I know people have been requesting this ski all winter long and I apologize. I was kind of holding off on reviewing this ski in part because I had a vocal rep who said he was gonna send me skis. I believe from what he said, there was a big warehouse issue where skis weren't getting shipped out. So. I was basically waiting on that, thinking I was going to get the Kendo 88 from them, but for whatever reason it fell through. I'm not here to bash the vocal rep. I am gonna take what he's saying in good faith that he meant to send the skis and that the warehouse really is having issues. And there may even be more skis on the horizon that I'm gonna review. But after a certain point, I wanted to review what you guys wanna see, and this was by far one of the most requested skis. So today, I'm reviewing this Vocal Kendo 88 in a 177, which means it has a 16 meter turn radius. As the name says, these have eight millimeters width underfoot. Just holding them in your hand, very slight amount of tip splay, almost none, and then next to no tail splay. But, uh, you know, a slight amount. It's definitely there, but it's marginal at best. When looking at camber, there's a minor amount of camber, not a ton, but a little bit. Now, as far as specs and build, these have a multi-layer wood core. Specifically, it's a combination of beech and poplar. They basically use a harder wood towards the middle, underfoot in the binding, and then get use that kind of lighter, more pliable wood towards the tip. They also have Vocal's full sidewall. If you look at it, you can kind of see the sidewall in black here on the ski. But when they say full sidewall, it means that there is a sidewall entirely from tip to tail. You can barely see it there if you kind of look. It even wraps around the tips a little bit. When it comes to laminates, you can see in the tips, they have what's called their tailored carbon tips. It's basically like individual carbon strands kind of coming through there. And then they use what they call their tailor tightened frame, which essentially adjusts how much tightened they put in different parts of the ski depending on its length so that all size skis feel similar. What can happen sometimes if you remember like old GS skis is with longer skis you can have more leverage in the middle so it can result in a longer ski feeling softer because it kind of has this leveraged out soft spot in the middle of it. So what they are now doing is they are customizing it so that all length skis get a similar experience. What they're trying to avoid, honestly, is that there would be rumors that like, oh, that's a bad size in that ski. They don't want to have any bad sizes. They want people to like all lengths of the ski. So that's kind of why they do that. Back in the early 2000s, you would be like, oh, you know, don't get the Salmonic Scream in a 185 because that's a bad size. I don't know how much truth there was to that. I think that people could dislike certain lengths. I do know it was a real thing with race skis. Back in my Rossignol Radical days, I had a 191 and I was a pretty light guy back then. You know, it was like 150 pounds and six foot. And the 191 was actually pretty good because it had kind of a bigger soft spot in it. So it's a real thing. I'm not sure that it was ever that detrimental. You could argue about that. But in this case, they are adjusting the Titanol to make it kind of 
size accordingly. For this size, the ski weighs 1,898 grams. So at least for this size specifically, it's a little bit on the denser side, but not too bad. So now that we've talked stats, specs, and build, let's talk about the most important part. How did these feel on the snow? So I have to say, I finally understand why so many of you guys recommended these. One of my favorite slalom skis of all time was the Vocal Race Tiger, and I think that this kendo borrows heavily from their slalom ski design. I had a ton of fun on it throughout the day. You know, the snow was really good in the morning, but it got kind of deteriorated throughout the day. But I found myself to always be having fun. And it was the first time since I stopped ski racing over a decade ago that I felt like I was making real slalom turns. On the steep pitches, this was my favorite ski to ski steep and narrow pitches. I just had a ton of fun on it. Now, on narrow trails, especially when they're steep, that was the most fun I've had. Honestly, I should take the skiing with my wife because those are her favorite trails and I don't tend to like them in wide open radius skis because they just can't finish off their turns. This ski finishes off its turn so well and it has the most flexibility out of any ski I've seen with turn radius. It can adjust its turn radius so well. I know that they advertise that by design and I'm here to tell you that's real. This ski really is good at adjusting its line and getting in those tight radius turns. You know, maybe I was just delusional, but I felt like a slalom skier again. They're definitely on the heavier side, they're definitely on the chargier side, but when it comes to spring skiing, that's the kind of ski I want anyways. I would say too, if you're between this and the Vocal Mantra, the Vocal M6 Mantra is a lot like how I remember the Vocal GS skis and vice versa. I had a pair of Race Tiger Slalom skis that I loved, and this felt a lot like that. So if you wanna think of it that way, I think the M6 Mantra is a lot like a GS ski, and this Kendo 88 feels a lot like a Slalom ski. So if you're looking at sizing, I got these in 177, and I was very happy with that length because I like those quick short radius turns. Whereas the M6 Mantra, for my height, I'd probably want a 180 or more because I'm six foot one. But these were a lot of fun. So if you're kind of wondering the difference, that was my big takeaway there. All right, now that we talked first impressions, let's talk good and then we'll talk about the bad. The good with this ski, honestly, this is excellent carving. In all conditions, I think this is excellent, excellent carving. I probably wouldn't take it off trail unless I really had to, but if you're talking about like a West Coast carving ski, this was probably one of my favorite carving skis I've been on all year. What an absolute treat. I wish I'd tried this sooner in the year, but here we are, and I was just having an absolute blast carving on these. This is one of the first all mountain skis, or just a handful of all mountain skis, that I really felt like I could push myself carving wise and drive myself to be better, drive myself to be more aggressive. You know, it's kind of a stiffer ski, but it creates a really good platform. But sometimes with stiffness can come deadness. These are very responsive and they have just these nice soft spots in it that give you a lot of different turn shapes you can make, a lot of turn flexibility, a lot of kind of pushing your limits, using your body position to just see how far you can get the skis over on edge. Whereas other all mountain skis will kind of wash out or they're very limited. This ski was not. It is really, if you're somebody who wants to push your carving further, who really cares about carving a lot and wants to get good at carving big lines and have lots of flexibility and play with your turn radius, I think this is an excellent option. The other thing I'll say, with a lot of carving skis, sometimes what they'll do is they'll sacrifice dampness for responsiveness and just level of feel. Renown kind of does that. I would say this is on the damper side. So if you're somebody who really wants a ski that can carve and be damp, I think this is a really good candidate. I really liked how well this absorbed energy. If you pushed it and took it off trail in areas it wasn't comfortable in, yeah, you're gonna get some weird angles and some weird chop. But for the basic spines and bumps you'd see on the groomers, these handled it excellently. The timing of when it hooks with this turn radius makes for a very satisfying turn. All in all, what I really like about these skis is that you can charge hard on them, you can ski fast on them, you're not gonna get any speed wobble, but it also really allows you to push those tight radius turns without having to sacrifice stability and sacrifice speed. I, another ski that I really like is the Mirus Core. I think they do a good job with short radius turns, but they struggle once you go fast. Same for the Elan Ripstick. These skis are able to give you the short radius turn that you like without sacrificing speed wobble or chatter. And I think that that 
is what kind of elevates the ski above even some of those other skis. At least, again, if you're just looking specifically for carving. All right, now that we've gotten all chummy and I've sung this ski's praises, let's talk about the bad. And this ski, like every ski, has downsides. And if you're buying the ski, don't you wanna know the downsides? I know that it's easy with ski videos. Oh, this is the greatest thing ever, and go buy it, and blah, blah, blah. Every ski has a downside, and I'm gonna tell you about this skis, because if you buy it, you will be stuck with it. And I don't want anyone to buy a ski that they're gonna regret. So let me tell you the bad that I found. This ski gets a little locked into its turn. Once it kind of latches on, it's like a dog chasing a mailman. It just latches on and it doesn't let go. So if the ski gets really set on a direction, it can be a little bit difficult to redirect. Now, it's not impossible, but it takes real strength to kind of get it off of its track. The ski has flexibility in its turn radius, but if you have to like totally redirect it in a different direction, like say somebody turns on you last minute, it's really unsatisfying if it gets out of that track. You know, it's kind of a double-edged sword. If you take the line that it's kind of locked into, it feels great, it's very satisfying. But if you don't, <laughs> because they're so stiff, because they're such a kind of damp ski, it can be really hard to make last minute redirections. And while you can certainly do it, and you're not gonna be unsafe while skiing on these, it feels really bad when it has to get redirected. What that translates to is if you take them off trail, they're very unsatisfying because off trail, you know, you might have brush or bramble or a tree that is kind of in a weird spot that you have to redirect quickly. These skis really suffer with that. So, you know, they're in the all mountain category, but just so you know, I would say that these are a ski that I would want to keep on the groom bruns primarily. If you had some last minute powder, they certainly wouldn't struggle in that, or especially if you get kind of that old wet mashed potatoes in spring skiing, they handle that fairly well. But when it comes to trees or last minute turns, they, they are kind of set in their ways and they struggle to redirect in a really quick way. But I don't think the people buying this are looking for that, but I want you to know the downside because with good construction comes weaknesses. And that's just part of the game. That's part of understanding what you're getting so you know what the ski's role is for, so you can help build out your quiver in a kind of strategic way. And with that kind of different used wood, yeah, it doesn't redirect really well, but it creates a lot of carving angles. Like you can, some skis get really set into one turning radius. I would say that this is the ski that has the most flexibility in turning radiuses when carving. But once you get outside of that range, that's when the ski struggles the most. I know that sounds a little weird. So like if you're carving and you can kind of keep it on edge and you're in this radius range, like let's say the turn radius, you know, they label it as 16 meters, but let's say it's somewhere between 15 and 18, something like that. You could probably make those turns in a pretty meaningful way. But <laughs> if you have to wash out into a 14 meter radius, some skis can kind of compromise and then hook back in in a kind of fun way. This ski doesn't do that. It's got the best range for carving radius that I've seen for full on carving. But once you get outside of that, that's where the ski really struggles and really becomes hard to send in a new direction. But I would say that that's mostly nitpicks. Overall, my carving experiences with this ski was extremely positive. So now that we've talked about the good and we've talked about the bad, let's talk score. This ski is a little tricky to score. I guess every ski is. This was one of the most fun skis I had carving. It made me feel like a better skier. It does have that very distinct vocal ski style where you need to kind of break at the waist a little bit more and you have to kind of, you know, get a little bit more angulation with your ankles. And sometimes it can feel like you're not getting as strong downhill pressure. There's just something about these skis when you get into certain pitches where it feels like you're kind of double turning with the ski, but it doesn't feel bad. It's just very distinct to vocal. I think a lot of it has to do with the ski shape because it doesn't have a really distinct hourglass, a lot of the bite kind of comes in at the middle of the ski. So you can feel like you're initiating later in the turn and you're kind of broken more at the hip to kind of get that same angle. But I think certain people really like that. And once I got used to it, I found it to be extremely satisfying, extremely responsive, and extremely just charging and fast and strong. So. Just so you know, if you hate that style and you only want to initiate on the tips or you only want to kind of be on the tails all the time, this ski's a little bit more of the middle. Take that with a grain of salt. Make sure that that style kind of lines up with what you like. But if you can adjust to that style and learn to kind of master that style, you will really, really enjoy this ski. So as somebody who paid for their own demo, who isn't sent these skis by Vocal yet, <laughs> 
Vocal is supposed to be sending me something, but as somebody who is certainly not paid by Vocal or any other company, I'm gonna give you my honest opinion. I've got no skin in the game. I don't care if you buy skis. I'm just here to tell you the truth about skis so you don't have any regrets or you can kind of narrow down what you might like. But for me, this ski was absolutely phenomenal. I had a blast on this. They were fun to ski in the spring. They're not a total crud cutter like the M6 Mantra, but I would say like a very responsive ski for the steeps and for all snow types. I think this would be an excellent option on the East Coast. I think it'd be an excellent option out here on the West Coast. I do think that this is kind of a Western United States carving ski, just because like it's gonna give you diversity in what kind of snow you can take and I don't think it's a good off trail ski. I think it's mainly on piste where I would take it. But when you find what it's good at, it thrives and just, it, it, it's, it's a total rocket under your feet. So for me personally, I'm gonna give this ski a 9.3 out of 10. I like this ski better than the head core. This ski made me feel like a slalom skier again. It gave me such good diversity in turn shape. I know I talked about that before, but to me that's really valuable. Being able to play with my turn radius and kind of set up my lines in different and meaningful ways is really important. It had a very stable platform to kind of build off. I never felt like I found the bottom of the ski with power. It's certainly not a ski I would recommend to people who are an intermediate or even on the lower end of advanced. This is a ski for somebody who really knows how to load it up. But once you master that style and finding the soft spot and loading up the ski, it's extremely, extremely rewarding. And this is a very well designed and built ski. So overall, I was thrilled by this. I think, you know, when you look at the all mountain category, it, it being a little locked into its turns is really what kind of separated it from, you know, something like an Atomic Maverick. And it's not the most accurate kind of pingy ski, but I will say it's one of the most responsive and one of the most fun skis to kind of alter its turn radius in. The things that it's good at and the things that it sets out and the way that it's built is really a marvel of ski engineering. So, like I said, this is a 9.3. I think this is an absolutely fantastic ski. So anyway, if you're interested in buying this ski, I know the 2024s have gone on sale, at least last time I looked. I believe they have. I will put a link down below. It's an affiliate link. It'll bring you to evo.com usually, depending on what the inventory looks like. But if this review helped you and you want to buy the skis, consider using the link because it does support the channel. Like I said before though, I don't really care if you buy the skis, just if you're already planning on doing it and you found this helpful and you want to support the channel, that's one way you can do it. Beyond that, just thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. If you like this kind of content, please consider liking and subscribing. We also have channel memberships and everything like that. But as always, at the end of the day, like I said before, I really just appreciate you guys being here and watching my videos. Because you watch my videos, I am able to demo these skis and give you my honest opinion. Um, so, as always, thank you, and per usual, I'll see you in the next one. See ya. Technician.